Hello, everyone, and welcome to this IoT at the Point of Care meetup, uh, this virtual meetup that was originally intended to be held at the HIMSS Annual Conference in Orlando, which, you know, hard to believe that a month ago we were supposed to be in Orlando and everything that's changed. Uh, ironically, I guess, in some respects, uh, the world has evolved, and I think this topic has become even more important amidst the crisis and the pandemic that we're experiencing. So I'm excited that our panelists were able to join us virtually, even though you know this would have been more fun, I think, in person at the uh, Dell, uh, Dell Technologies booth there at HIMSS. But uh, we're excited to at least bring this conference to you, uh, this uh, meetup to you virtually in this uh, this format. So if you're watching live and you have any questions, please put them in the uh, question area and we'll do our best to incorporate them. And if not, we'll take a look at them and answer them after the fact as well and send you know, responses that way. But uh, thank you for joining live or the recorded version. And also thanks to Dell Technologies for hosting this meetup and, and being the uh, sponsor for this event. So. Thank you so much. Uh, my name is John Lynn. I'm the founder of Healthcare IT Today. I think a lot of you know me already, a publication with over 13,000 articles, over uh, 14 years that we've been writing this content. So we're excited to host this discussion. And, and really, it was amazing that two, two, over two, three months ago, we started this, uh, the planning for this meetup. And we, were, we said, you know, IoT data at the point of care is such an important topic. And now, as everything is being shut down and patients aren't able to access the, the, their doctor, and in, in at least the modalities are changing and uh, people are being required to stay at home this topic has become more and more relevant. So hopefully today we can provide some insights into what's happening, what's been accelerated. Uh, you know, we, we have a, a, a patient advocate on the line so that you know, we'll be able to have that perspective and what are they experiencing on the front lines. And we even have a, a CISO, which uh, I think you know, security and privacy is still important, even though right now the world has changed and a lot of those policies have been uh, thrown out the door to some extent with some uh, enforcement discretion from HIPAA. So and anyways, let's uh, introduce all of our panelists and go around. Uh, Steve, you want to start with start us? I'd be glad to. And thank you very much. Uh, my name is Stephen Laser. I'm the global healthcare CTO for Dell Technologies. And uh, with that, uh, spend a tremendous amount of time working with our field and time working with customers all over the world. Uh, and looking at how we can, can impact healthcare and healthcare delivery and looking at ways we can utilize technology to simplify delivery, uh, make things faster, better, more cost effective, and really bring healthcare to the masses and deliver on the promise of healthcare. Awesome. Great to have you here, Steve. Uh, Mitch, you want to go next? So, uh, yes, I'm Mitch Parker. I'm the CISO at IU Health out in Indianapolis, Indiana. Had the chance to work with Steve a few years ago when I was at Temple Health. We, when we implemented EMC storage for one of our EMRs. So great to see you again, Steve. And in addition to doing security full time, I do uh, actually do some writing for John as well and for a few other publications. That's awesome. Great to have you here. And of course, the CISO is the one that can wear the, the backwards hat on a go-to webinar. That seems really appropriate. I love it. I'm jealous. You really don't <laughs> want to see here. It's, I had a barber's appointment that I was going to make before this all went down. So it looks bad. Hey, I, I think I'm about to head to Steve's style since my fro is, uh, you know. <laughs> Thanks, Mitch. Uh, Grace, you want to go next? <laughs> Hi everyone, Grace Cordovano. I'm a board certified patient advocate specializing in the oncology space. My day to day is working with patients and their loved ones from point of diagnosis through survivorship or end of life care planning. I am in northern New Jersey in a hotspot area for COVID-19 and the implications and impact on what point of care really looks like now in the face of a pandemic in the face of already high risk conditions, chronic illnesses, cancer, rare disease and disability uh, has been tremendous. So uh, I'm looking forward to having a good conversation and bringing some of those insights to the table. Yeah, thanks Grace and uh, thanks for joining us amidst the, uh, you, you really are in the epicenter of everything that's happening with uh, COVID-19 there in New Jersey, New York area. So thank you so much for joining us. All right, last but not least, Wendy. 
W comes at the end of the alphabet. <laughs> I am a solution architect in uh, the health and life sciences team for Intel. We support the field sales uh, globally, and I help. I, mean, I work with ISVs and partners to develop these healthcare solutions um, that have Intel inside, I guess. But um, the the I loved what um, you know has been said about the pandemic influencing everything, and I just think um, it's tragic. But um, we're, we're we're somewhat at an inflection point because we're seeing you know this adoption and the need for this what we're, we're we're hearing people calling the new normal with telehealth and being able to you know support doctors being outside of the room and monitoring patients and monitoring patients at home you know we i know we've all talked about this in our industry for a long time so it's it's helpful that we have this technology available and hopefully we'll be better prepared in the next um, years to come. Definitely. Thanks for joining all of you. And, uh, and you're right that uh, it, it is a tragic situation that we're in, but I think there are some positive elements as far as adoption of telehealth, as far as adoption of remote IoT and, and other things. So, you know, I think we have to make the most of those positives. Um, also, if you're watching and you want to, we're live tweeting this on HITSM hashtag, and also be sure to share any insights and perspectives on the hashtag transform HIT as well. So if you want, you know, you're following along virtually, you can see those uh, live tweets happening. Uh, Steve, so let's start this off. Where are you seeing, you know, the exciting IoT stuff being implemented really at the point of care, I think is where we want to talk about. Of course, IoT is happening across all of our lives, but what, what are the exciting IoT things you see happening at the point of care? Um, from a point of care perspective, uh, as my colleagues have already noted, the point of care is moving. It is moving away from that centralized healthcare system. The point of care is moving to where we are right now in our own homes, working off of our desktops, our laptops, or mobile devices, or whatever else we're looking at. Uh, the capabilities from a sensor perspective have continued to grow and continue to expand. Uh, the ability to get a Bluetooth monitoring device for stethoscope uh, is one that really blew me away, and that's been around for about six to seven months or so that is FDA qualified. Uh, the ability to go get uh, to get an otoscope and be able to take a look at what's going on from a patient perspective and really have that true exam capability anywhere at this point. Uh, our limitations are communications is really where that has moved to. We're starting to see broad-based implementation. We're seeing relaxation in government regulatory around the capabilities. Um, one of the things that we've seen a huge demand for is virtual care and the extension of that care system outside the healthcare network to protect our caregivers and protect our clinicians in order to not have them constantly exposed to patients with COVID. Um, <clears throat> to say that we're in an inflection point, Wendy, was absolutely an understatement. The promise of this has been here forever. This is Fortunately or unfortunately, this is the kick I think that will put us permanently over the edge. Uh, this is not a temporary thing from my perspective. This is a long-term change. This is a paradigm change. And I think that as we start going forward, uh, we need to look at this as though this is very much the new way of doing business. Yeah, and I, I think you bring out some great points, Steve, around the idea of protecting patients, which is great and convenient for them to stay at home. But I think one of the things that's been holding back many of the implementations of these things is it didn't change the provider situation very much. Their workflow was still the same, the work required was still the same, and they were getting paid less in some cases. Now they're working on parity. But what really has changed is the risk to the provider, which now that risk has forced them and given them a compelling reason to adopt these solutions, uh, which I think is really great. Wendy, you know, you obviously see a lot of these things happening, you know, across a whole variety of people that are using Intel Inside, including Dell, of course, is, is a partner of yours. So, um, what are you seeing happening in IoT? And then maybe we'll hit Grace and you can kind of give the patient perspective as well. Well, I'm seeing um, 
the need to connect up smart cities and be connected to the hospital and the, you know, like, so imagine your city has connected up the, the education and the healthcare system and now, and so there's something in the home that you can use to communicate. That's something that cities are thinking about. Um, we're also, we're also working, well, we're working with a partner that's, um, I think Dell, it's a Dell partner as well. They are enabling remote ICU monitoring. I think that's very important to be able to make that flexible and be able to stay outside that, um, you know, infectious ICU situation with, with patients that, um, you know, have COVID right now, but it, it could be used in any, you know, in, in multiple instances, um, you know, use cases. And the other one, you know, the other one is, I think, is taking that to the home, the, the smart city. It's kind of tied in with the smart city, but, but taking it to the home so that we can monitor and see, you know, in the case of COVID, see when, when they're, you know, they might be asymptomatic, they may you know, be feeling fine, or they may have just been near somebody that was sick, and monitoring them in the home allows them to stay out of the hospital, but um, being, you know, in one place away from other healthy people, and um, we can still no be notified when it starts to um, turn badly. So, um, but then, as I said, like the new normal, let's take that through till, you know, to managing chronic conditions, like, you know, like we've been talking about for years. So it's, it's, um, that's what we're hearing the patients talking, you know, the, the customers talking about and they're, what they're really interested in, in, um, yeah, we you know, forget about about remote ICU. Example. Yeah, remote ICU is a great example. I mean, I even think of my parents three years ago. I don't think they've done a, done a single video call, and now they've done hundreds. I mean, you know, so the technology adoption by many of those people, the senior population in particular, that you know is uh, very vulnerable, now has those devices, which is powerful. Grace, you want to chime in? Yes. Oh, I have so many things to say. So I want to point out, first of all, um, from my perspective, uh, most patients have been begging to have remote monitoring and begging for telemedicine consults and have been locked and loaded and it's always been a flat out no no you have to come in you have to come in so now we've cut through all this red tape and i'm seeing more of the hospitals and the physicians struggling to get the telemedicine consult. I'm actually scheduling Zoom on behalf of physicians and patients who don't have access to FaceTime. So here I am, it's, it's, it's a very much twilight world situation for me because I have the privilege of attending a lot of fantastic conferences and speaking at them and meeting incredible people and being at the edge of the innovation that's available on the exhibit floor. And then I come home and where is it? And why, why do we not have it? So patients are definitely hungry for it. Um, I think with respect to COVID specifically, uh, people want access to be able to monitor their symptoms at home. So patient reported outcomes um, and a simple little tool for monitoring oxygen, a pulse oximeter. Uh, when symptoms get concerning and we have shortness of breath, at what point when you're living in a hot spot area, when there's refrigerated trucks for bodies, okay, and you don't know if your hospital is able to take on another patient, people are hesitating to make that call to go to the hospital. So they're looking to see, can they monitor their oxygen at home? They're, they're leveraging telehealth consultations and in contact with physicians to see, you know what, can I weather this at home? And um, with respect to also the overflow and the saturation of our emergency rooms, uh, we're missing data from a patient perspective. I would love to be able to log in and look at what hospitals are actually ex accepting patients because some hospitals are closing their doors just because they're so full at the moment. Not that they're collapsing and, and they can't take on, it's just at the moment, maybe 50 people walk through the door. So maybe I should triage and go somewhere else if I'm having concerning symptoms. So a lot of unmet needs that are uh, critical when, when you're so afraid, when you already have a, a, a pre-existing condition that makes you part of that high-risk case, and now you have COVID. 
Yeah, and it's interesting, the data that's come out of some of that, uh, in some ways, it's been really compelling. When you look at the temperature, you know, the digital thermometer readings across an area and how that's changed because of this as possible indicators. And you look at that and you're like, wow, there's such power there. Or even the digital movement and how, many, how much people are moving. It's like, wow, there's so much power there. But then you also look at it in other regards and you're like, we can't even get data from hospitals to assess the population health based on the data in the EHR. So there's this kind of dichotomy Dichotomy that we have a lot of data, but there's still so much more data that's not being shared on this kind of population health level that there is this kind of disconnect between it uh, that I think is challenging for many of us that are in the situation. Mitch, let's come to you, and you know you can certainly extend the conversation about what you, what you're seeing, but also the, you know let's take it a step further and really discuss you know what's needed to deploy this this type of technology, especially at the edge which is where most of the IoT is. I mean, I think there are cases in the virtual ICU that is kind of enterprise level, but at the edge, what are some of the things we need to do to deploy and what else are you seeing, Mitch? So I can tell you right now, I mean, I was taking a look at the curve of inpatient versus outpatient as converging sometime in a couple of years that outpatient revenues would eclipse inpatient ones. We just moved that up. It's that's going to change. That's going to probably change how we think about the point of care, which ultimately means you're moving it towards you're moving it towards the home. You're moving it towards where people are at. Because what's one of the biggest issues physicians have? Compliance, monitoring, making sure that there's a condition happening that the patient doesn't even know about it. Can you make sure? How do you alert someone that that's happening? And how do you do so securely? Because right now. When you start taking a look at smart cities, I actually read a very interesting paper on smart cities that was done over in the Middle East. And one of the things that I got out of reading that paper and preparing some work on that for a now canceled at Triple E presentation was that smart cities are lower late, they're higher latency. If you send information back in a smart city type of arrangement, it takes a it doesn't matter if, it, if it's a few seconds, where with healthcare, that really matters and i think one of the items we've taken into account here is it's now taken a step from wi-fi which again we've done an incredible job of making wi-fi work in our hospitals and our centers of care however for us to do this correctly we need to make sure our cell networks have that near same level of reliability when they're sending data and i think there's a lot of work we're doing with 5g specifically on lower frequencies that could really really help with that and i think that we are, it's it's like the shift from inpatient to outpatient now we have to take a look at the shift from wireless wi-fi to 5g and the shift from putting the devices that do point of care behind enclaves and defenses that we have to realizing these things are going to be out in the wild, and we need to really understand how to harden these devices, how to make sure we monitor them, and how to keep them secure. So I like to call it the law of cascading effects. What we're talking about today is going to have completely cascading effects on how we build and manage and operate the healthcare delivery environment as it is. And when you take a look at everything I laid out there, you take a look at the move over to from inpatient to outpatient, the move to Wi-Fi to 5G, the move to a low latency environment where you've still got to have it remote but still have low latency, and plus also the move towards devices that have to be resilient by design, and you have to even think how you're going to deliver them and how you're going to monitor them. It's a complete change, and I don't think there's enough, there's enough ways to say it. Healthcare is changing right now. It's changing in front of us, and these are items a lot of us have started talking about for years, and now people are finally listening. And again, to your point, Grace, this is what the patients want. And also, to your point, you're in northern New Jersey. Real estate where you're at is at a premium. Hospital beds cost several million dollars to build. So... Everyone's asking the question, how do we deliver the same level of care with the same level of security and the same level of integrity at a lower cost? Because the current building boom, in my mind, is also completely unsustainable. 
Mitch, I'd and have no to one add to one other comment there three. if I could. Go ahead, Steve. Go ahead. Mitch, I, I think that as we talk about building this out and talk about building that same level of care, I think we need to talk about it building with an increased level of security. Um, the level of security within healthcare has been a struggle to date. It's been a challenge to date. I think that we need to go ahead and look at this in a whole new paradigm. There are some very interesting functions and features of the 5G spectrum that we could talk about, including secure channels for data communication and things like that as ways that we can go ahead and extend that healthcare system outside the four walls. And uh, we would be happy to have a conversation with anyone that would like to follow up on it. Uh, but it is one of those things that I look at in my overall role is how can we apply technologies like 5G and working with many of the 5G providers at right. this time to go ahead and bring forward solutions that will work with them and can take advantage of the capabilities we can provide there. I agree with you on so that, Steve. Steve and that, that work slicing can't come soon enough. <laughs> So Steve, I mean, would you say that 5G, and Wendy, you can chime in after if you want, is 5G uh, more secure or less secure, or is it one of those things like most security that it depends on how you implement it? Very much dependent on how it's implemented. Uh, there are discussions around the concept of data fabrics coming out of 5G and discussions around the ability to go ahead and cut off network slices or privatized communications, as Mitch alluded to. Uh, and the ability to go ahead and really bring additional security into it that we don't have today. Today, we're working on encrypted tunnels and encrypted communications. Uh, Grace, you heard the request. I heard the request from your discussion about how do we get additional functionality out to the edge. Um, virtual care EMRs are actually out there and available today. As a matter of fact, the, uh, the market right now has gone a little bit crazy with them. The ability to go ahead and bring them forward and uh, and bring them into the healthcare system is ripe right now. And it's something that can be done fully remote to go ahead and enable the capabilities that you're looking for. Uh, which IoT devices we're talking about at the point of care really depends on what you're trying to deliver with it. From a COVID monitoring perspective, several organizations are out there and clamoring to get into the market. Mm -hmm. yep. It's kind of embarrassing that Grace is setting up Zoom calls to do that, right? I mean, that like the the the, the providers aren't capable or not choosing to do this themselves. Uh, anyway, it's a that that's it's sad to even hear that. Wendy, it looked like you were trying to chime in. One. Oh yeah, I just want to say I completely agree with this uh, the advent of 5G and that how that could really accelerate what we're doing in IoT and IoT connectivity. We saw in uh, Asia that 5G was used throughout, you know, across the board for their response to COVID. And uh, we saw it, you know, with 5G robotics and building of these rapid, rapidly uh, established hospitals and, and in remote monitoring. And so, and I agree it needs to be secure and it has the capability of doing that. So. Great. It's good to hear that. Grace, uh, what's your take on, on this discussion of, you know, deploying it and also, you know, some of the security discussion? Mm -hmm. So I, I want to change the lens a little bit on how you get this to the edge. Uh, so there's definitely not a, a, a limit on technology. The technologies are that definitely there. It's the red tape of implementation. It's the reimbursement. It's the legal and regulatory issues. So we've cut through a lot of all of that. Um, I think the way that you really implement this is um, pre-pandemic. This is where patients have been living. This is where they need, I think the patient-centered model is dead. We need to be focused on what I'm calling life-focused care supporting people to live the best life possible, no matter what their diagnosis, what their living situation is. And, and we can do that. And it's going to have to incorporate social determinants of health. Um, we're talking about 5G. And there's people that have no internet um, right now and are cut off from their local public libraries. So there's clearly uh, a need to level the playing field um, across the board because public health is health and our zip codes play such an important role in how we navigate our regular lives, let alone a pandemic. 
Um, I also want to point out too, we keep talking about patients and the point of care and our physicians and the point of care, but it's extremely stressful. So I'm also the primary care partner for two disabled adults and two adults who are in the high risk category. And I can't go near any one of them. I don't know about their blood pressure. I don't know about any of their vitals and things that normally are being tracked. I'm, I can't go see them. Um, so it's extremely stressful. Are they taking their medication? Um, is the water weight going up? Is, you know, how's the congestive heart failure going really? Uh, so for a care partner who's like a heat-seeking missile looking for information, we really need to bring them into these conversations about leveraging because I always hear the pushback, well, patients don't really want the technology or the elderly are not tech savvy. I mean, I'm working with immigrant populations where the child and the young adult who is the English speaker as a second language or is more tech savvy and is navigating this whole broken healthcare system for their parents and families who don't speak English. So I think we have to be more out of the box and more considerate on how people are living with their diagnoses. And I think we'll see some enlightening solutions there at that edge. Yeah, <laughs> thanks for adding that. I love the idea of, uh, I don't know if it, I don't know if I'd go as far as you to say patient-centered care is dead. Uh, that might be a bad message in some ways, but the idea of shifting that to a higher level of life-centered care mm -hmm. is, is a valuable idea to really think about how do you push forward beyond patient-centered care to their life because they have more to their life than just being a patient, which I think is what you're trying to say. Is that right, Grace? Yeah, it's we're done with the buzzword. I mean, everyone is patient centered. Everyone is provide patient centered, patient first, patient driven. But look, look what this pandemic did. It turned all of it upside down. So now you really see what's patient centered and what's not. So it, it leaves a lot. There's a lot left to be desired. Yeah. That's great. So, so there was a question from the audience, which I think was really interesting. And uh, yeah, I can't see the name of who, but they, they actually said for Mitch. So we can start off with you, Mitch. Are there any new challenges in terms of authentication, both people and devices? I, I think this is a really important topic as far as, okay, that's great that you have the device, but how do we know who has the device, who was measured on the device and that type of things? Any initial thoughts there, Mitch, on authentication and identification? You know what's worse than no authentication process? A bad authentication process. And the only thing worse than no encryption is bad encryption. So, we, and again, it goes back to the point I made earlier about when you have to have monitoring in place, you have to make sure you also have corresponding operational processes to make sure people are who they are. And there's a point I always like to make, and I made this point to a bunch of medical device manufacturers last year down in Bloomington, Indiana, which was you need to get out of the identity management business because, again, to Grace's point, people want to live their lives. And don't waste your time and effort building authentication systems. Don't waste your time and effort reinventing the wheel when someone's already done a better job than you leverage the systems that are already out there. People want to use their Google account to authenticate, to say who they are. Google has a very good service. Use a service like that. Use a service like what Microsoft provides because, again, if you give people another username and password, there's a saying I like to say at my job. I give someone another username and password, there's a very high probability that's going to end up on a Post-it note somewhere. And it's even more tragic when that happens to a patient. So we need to be thinking about what do we really need to be focusing on? And what we need to be focusing on is delivering a good, secure, and resilient device and not focusing on items that other people do better. Integrate those in. Use the standards that are out there. ISO puts out great standards. IEEE does. Leverage them for your benefit. And make sure that you're able to have the good operational processes so when you deploy a device to a home, you know who it is. Make sure the device checks back in because, again, I have DME in my house, and I have to sometimes tell the people who the DME belongs to. Why can't it use a low-power device? Why can't it, uh, I can I authenticate in and have and have a track that that device has been assigned to me? Why do I have to go through the effort of, of doing the work on my own? Again, we want to get it to the point where we get the drudge work out of the way. And the only way we're going to do that is by thinking outside the box on these processes 
and making it so people don't have to go through jumping all these hoops. Companies don't have to go through all the hoops of maintaining things that are not their core competency. And we can more focus on who owns what, who can, and how can we get them the data they need rather than worrying about things that take up time and resources that take away from providing better security and quite frankly, providing a better, better source of information, better data and better quality of service. And I, I think Grace is probably thinking, I don't have a DME in my house. I'm not even sure what a DME is, right? <laughs> So I think we have yes. to be aware of what's Thank happening, you. right? And make it accessible, right? Uh, obviously, I'm a tech guy, you're a tech guy, you know, we have a lot of tech people on this, you know, but how do we make it accessible to everyone, right? And I, I think your example, right, using the authentication they know makes sense. Steve uh, and then Wendy, uh, any other thoughts on, you know, on this authentication or you know i think mitch brings up a great point though the key is probably having good partners which i think both of you embrace the kind of partner mindset that's needed uh you know how do you approach partners and and you know how do we manage things like the authentication uh, from a partner perspective uh we very definitely approach partners and work with many many different partners at dell technologies um including those that are providing virtual chair solutions, including those that are providing uh, 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 extended devices to use in the home, as well as other devices. Uh, how we go about authenticating that is through the applications typically and getting application integration into some authentication methodology. Um, from an end user perspective or a patient perspective, that authentication methodology uh, is something that we can go through in detail and spend some time on. but it utilizes standard technologies out there, such as those from our partners, whether they be Microsoft, whether they be Google, whether they be Apple, whether they be any one of the above or others even. Um, <clears throat> and with that, the ability to su supply that in the security chain. The ability to supply that in a secure manner is something that we can go ahead and uh, be able to bring forward as part of that overall technology solution. Uh, Grace, I want to comment on your on your your note around that what I call the circle of care, the non-paid caregivers or non-professional caregivers. I think you'll find as you look at the virtual care solutions that are out on the market, most of them have some integration, if not a tremendous amount of integration, into that circle of care and family caregivers. The ability to go ahead and share that information based on choice and identity and be able to bring that information to caregivers such as yourself so that you can see what's happening with those patients that are out there. And Grace, if we can touch base offline, I have some things I'd like to share with you. That'd be great, thank awesome. you. Yeah, that's great. Wendy, do you wanna chime in here? And I, I think there's also something we can extend this because I think there is a challenge between enterprise devices and personal devices. And so, you know, like what's the line between how those should be used and how they should be embraced or not embraced uh, by the healthcare system. Whoops. <laughs> um, I, I, you know, I agree that using our partners um, to their expertise is invaluable. I mean, we need to get away from that hard coded password when you bring that device into the home and you don't know enough to, you know, so it needs to be, a forced situation where you need to go to go out and do it the right way. Um, I'm I'm not sure. I I mean I think at an enterprise level, sometimes you get into um, problems with too much ownership from various devices. You know where you know I've got my network, and then these other devices have their network. That's the kind of thing that um, makes makes it difficult for hospitals. They're always having to do a patch or do the cut over to the next system. And I think that's what makes it very, I think interoperability is an issue in enterprise. Um, and you know, and it, it obviously it would carry through to the home in the same way because you know hospitals want to be able to connect up quickly. You need to have these things all follow standards so that you can, scale i mean you want to scale that's our issue we need to and right now we need to scale rapidly and so standards i think are the key to you know making it making it uh us you know 
care that everyone can have access to securely. Yeah. Do you want to chime in? Chime in, Mitch, uh, you know, from an enterprise perspective, how are you approaching kind of balancing personal devices versus enterprise devices? And, you know, there's security elements, there's connectivity elements, there's trust elements. I mean, there's a lot that goes into those two types of devices. What are your perspectives on it? So there's actually a third category I'm going to add in. And by the way, DME is durable medical equipment. I've got a CPAP machine. So... When you take a look at it, you've got the hospital loan, you've got the personal devices, you've got, also got the third party devices that are prescribed by another physician that may or not be, may or may not be part of your healthcare system. However, everyone wants the results. So you have to, again, I bring up the Wi-Fi versus 5G. You've got to really think about this on the perspective of what's really important isn't who owns the device, but realistically, What's the data being used for? What's the intent? Who needs to see it? And how do we most securely abide by the conditions of the security and privacy rule to make sure that people are getting what they need? And I'm also gonna build in also with the 21st Century Cures Act final rule, which I believe President Trump was gonna be announcing at HIMSS, but unfortunately that got canceled. So what we're talking about there specifically is the use of the FHIR 4.01 API. So it comes down to who's entitled to produce and see the data, where's it going to, what's your data flows, and how is it being protected? Because ultimately, you're gonna see more personally owned devices in patient care. You're gonna, that crossover is going to happen and the 21st century cure that final rule means that it will happen because now you've got that API, you've got those standards we're talking about. And so we need to get up, honestly, get over that because it's already happening. It's just right now we're sneaker netting it. I have, for example, I'm gonna, I bring up my experience as a patient a lot because it helps people understand and empathize. So I have a machine supplied by someone else who I'm taking an SD card from a half hour away from my house to get red so I can continue to get more benefits and supplies for it. And honestly, that's something that shouldn't happen. So we need to get over about pers personal versus third party versus hospital and talk more about the device, the applications, who provides, who enti who's entitled to that data and how can we secure the, and focus on securing the process and making sure those who are entitled to see it can actually see it. Now that's great. I, I can see that's Grace great. Itch, itching to comment as well. I, I think on this, but let, let's continue extending the conversation too. And even around the idea, you know, this is a question from, uh, let's see, it looks like Honey Collis. Uh, sorry if I screwed up your name, but they asked, uh, what percentage of conditions do you believe can be covered with telehealth? And, you know, I would even expand that beyond just telehealth to other IoT devices tracking as well. You know, you know what are the, you know, challenges? Mitch talks about access to data, but, you know, I think that's one of those challenges in order to be able to provide the care remotely. But, you know, what, what's your take on, on what percentage can be covered by telehealth and what's needed? And I'm sure you'll love the word entitled to health care data since you run an organization called unblock healthcare but uh, go ahead Grace. <laughs> now, i'm going to go back because wendy said the word in interoperability which is a trigger point for me so when we talk about telehealth now here's what i'm seeing from a patient and care partner perspective and where we've royally failed uh, across the board in order for people to be proactive in a telehealth consultation let alone an actual in person they need access to their medical records they need to understand their condition. They need to be able to digest some of the information, them and their family, so that they can have an educated, informed decision about their care. What we're seeing now is people who have multiple comorbidities, chronic illness, cancer, are calling in for a telehealth consultation with people that they don't know, who don't have access to their records, and they're asking questions on the fly with poor connectivity where the, the connection goes in and out. Um, what are the medications? What's your diagnosis? When were you diagnosed? When did you have that surgery? What's your family history? All on the fly while maybe they're having shortness of breath. We could be doing so much more on an educational standpoint as to how to prime people for the business of their health, right? Because you should be, I advocate that my patient should treat every health encounter 
as a business meeting. And then when we start talking about now um, this whole concept of unblocked health, where, where, where you need access to the medical records and information blocking, and we, Mitch, you mentioned uh, the Cures Act and which apps are this digital app economy that's going to be booming now. Um, we need to talk about transparency. We're all having these discussions because of the privilege of the work that we do, but we're leaving out the consumer as to how they want their data used. And a lot of people, if they understand the initiatives and how things work, are willing to share their data. There's a lot of gray areas that patients and people and consumers are not happy about, not happy with all the holes that are in HIPAA, not happy with the way that big tech is handling data um, through BAAs. So th there's a lot to talk about here. And I think if we all commit to do no harm, which is what the premise of medicine is rooted in, and everything has grown from, um, perhaps we, we would be looking at things uh, significantly differently. Yep, and I think access to data is one of the challenges of IoT and being able to map where does that data need to be? Does it need to go to the caregiver, as you mentioned? Does it need to go to the doctor? If I send it to the doctor, what do they do with it? Are they liable for it? I mean, there's all these challenging questions. And as is always the case in healthcare, it seems, the only solution is hard work, right? Like the hard work of mapping who needs the data, the hard work of mapping to make sure it's secure, the hard work of knowing how to get that data. And then, you know, I would even add in, and you know, maybe this is a good way to kind of wrap up our discussion is, okay, if we have all this IoT data flowing to the doctor, how do does the doctor manage that? Does it need to be AI on top of it? You know, does it need to be, you know, we even, you know, in the pre-discussion talked about the artificial intelligence of things, which is a, an interesting concept to think about. Steve and Wendy, you want to chime in on that? Like, how do how does a healthcare organization manage this inflow and wave of data coming from IoT? Yeah, I think that's part of the reason why there's a hesitancy because they are, um, they're not sure how it's going to be managed. Um, I'll, I'll let Steve wrap us up though. No worries. Thank you. Um, from a data perspective, we've seen significant pushback from the clinicians because if we collect the data and bring the data in, they're responsible for looking at it. They must review it. They must understand it. Applying AI is something that I think eventually can be done, but having an AI model that learns and understands what's normal for Steve versus what's normal for Mitch, I apologize for picking on you, Mitch, or Wendy, or Grace, or John, or any of us, but because what's normal for each one of us is slightly different. So what falls inside the realm of normal? What falls outside the guardrails that we need to understand? So how do we go ahead and look at that and understand that? And until we can build an algorithm that understands what's normal for each one of us, and have that algorithm be a learning algorithm and apply that type of machine learning and then use that to create the AI. There's no other way that we can go ahead and bring this data in in an efficient manner. At the same time, as we're dealing with the masses, massive amounts of, uh, of information necessary to treat the masses that we're starting to see with this pandemic that we're currently involved in, um, we need to go ahead and look at how we can look at that information, be realistic about it, make some quick decisions. If we have too many false positives, our care providers will be overwhelmed. Uh, some of the other aspects of this, and I'm gonna jump back to something said earlier here, is that with the utilization of virtual care, one of the other things that we've really overlooked is how can we go ahead and expand that clinician to patient uh, load capability and be able to have a clinician see 30 or 40 or 50 or even 100 patients at a time utilizing technology. And to me, that is one of the biggest promises that I see coming forward to make those care providers much more efficient. Again, there's still a tremendous amount of information to look at that we're never going to get beyond that. But at the same time, we need to look at it smartly. Definitely. Well, uh, you know, unfortunately, we're we're at the end here. Uh, I want to thank you guys all for doing this. Uh, maybe we'll give Steve. I mean, you kind of gave some final words, but any final thoughts to those out there looking to implement IoT at the point of care? Um, for those that are looking to implement, and for those that are looking to have, find ways to go ahead and work with the overall masses of patient load that we're seeing today, um, 
there are very definitely some solutions that are out there in the marketplace. Uh, and from a Dell Technologies perspective, if that's something that you wish to engage in, we'd be happy to engage and share some perspective on it. Uh, we work with a number of virtual care companies as well as, uh, as other capabilities around the overall pandemic. And on behalf of Dell Technologies, I'd like to thank everyone for joining us today. We truly appreciate the, uh, the capabilities here from a virtual meetup. Uh, we'd also like to note, have, have you note that this uh, webinar is being recorded. And if you'd like to see it, uh, it will be posted on the Healthcare IT Today website and on our Virtual Hymns 20 website at delltechnologies.com slash hymns20. With that, I would like to say thank you to all. Stay well, stay safe, take care of each other, and be passionate in this time of need. Awesome. Thanks so much, Steve. Thanks for all of our panelists, and uh, we'll all see you online. Take care.